In order to calculate a value at risk to meet your specific requirements, it's necessary to choose an appropriate z-score for use in the VAR calculation. In this episode, I explain what a z-score is and how to use z-score tables to choose an appropriate value. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. If you're a talented trader looking to attract investor capital to your strategies, DarwinX is the fastest way for you to do this. We enable traders to raise third party investor capital and then charge success fees on high watermark profits. Additionally, DarwinX itself invests in its traders with our seed capital allocation program that allocates up to 90 million euros per year in successful trading strategies. So if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link here or you can find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. There's nothing mystical about a z-score. It's a really simple statistical tool. But when it comes to value at risk, you need to choose a value that's suitable for your own risk requirements. Let's see exactly how to do that. So this is where the z-score fits in to the value at risk calculation. It's basically a multiplier for the standard deviation. And as I said before, we're starting off simple. So we're just looking at the value at risk for a single position. But then in the future, we'll be using the Z scores in a similar way when we're calculating the value at risk for an entire portfolio. So as I said, this Z score acts as a multiplier on the standard deviation value. And it's what determines the confidence level that we're using for our value at risk. So for example, we might have a value at risk with a 95% confidence, or we might choose to do it with a 99% confidence. And it's the Z score itself that determines that confidence level. So last time we looked at the calculation that we needed to use for the standard deviation. So let's now take a closer look at the Z score. So to understand this a little better, I think it's worthwhile just looking back at what we did last time when we looked at the histogram of the daily price change percentages. And if you remember, we have a mean value here in the center of the histogram with a standard deviation below the mean and a standard deviation above the mean and within this range of the upper and lower standard deviation we can expect in a normal distribution to get about 68 percent of those daily price changes and then the remaining 32 percent we find in the left hand tail and the right hand tail now value at risk does assume that we have a normal distribution, which won't always be the case for price data. However, it's usually sufficient in order to provide us with a fairly good estimate of what that value at risk is. Now, I mentioned on the previous slide that the Z score acts as a multiplier for the standard deviation. Let's see why that's the case. So the notation for Z scores is such that the standard deviation below the mean, which you can see with this line here, is attributed a Z score of minus one. Equally, the standard deviation above the mean is attributed a Z score of positive one. And so by adjusting that Z score means that we can effectively move this line either left or right in order to capture more data on the right and less on the left or vice versa. And it's this adjustment of this line using the z-score that allows us to get the confidence level that we require. So if we could move this line so that we had just 5% of the data in the left hand tail, that means that for 95% of the time, 
the price changes will be above that level. And remember, that's exactly what value at risk is based on. It's this metric that tells you for either 19 out of 20 months, if you're using a monthly basis, or 19 out of 20 days, if you're using a daily VAR, that the daily price changes will be above a certain level. And it's only that one in 20 event, or 5%, that will go beyond that particular risk level. Now, to determine what that Z score is for a particular confidence level, we can use what's called a Z score table. And if you search for these online, you'll come across many examples where you can use these in order to calculate the exact Z score you require for a particular confidence level. So I've got the negative Z score table here because it's the left hand tail that we're interested in that that poses the most risk to our position. And so if we're using that 95% confidence level, we want to ensure 95% of those daily price changes are in this part of the curve and just 5% are in the left hand tail. And this left hand tail, of course, is the one that poses the most risk to our position because these are the heavily negative daily returns. So 5% can be represented as 0.05. And so it's a case of using this Z score table now to find the closest value to that, which is this one here. Now, the way that you read a Z score table is that you initially go to the left and this gives you the major part of the Z score value, which in this case is minus 1.6. You then go up to the top and this gives you the second decimal, which is 0.05. And so this tells us the Z score we require in order to get 5% of the values in that tail is minus 1.65. And remember that that 1.65 is used as a multiplier against the standard deviation value that we've already calculated. So what does this mean now to our value at risk formula? Well, if you're looking for a 95% value at risk, then this will be 1.65 times the standard deviation times the amount invested, as we've just seen. But using the table in a similar way, if you were instead interested in a 99% value at risk, that would give you a value of 2.33. Now, the value that I will be using in my future examples and in the code examples will be for a 95% value at risk, which tends to be the more common. And so I'll be using a value of 1.65. Now, we have now two components of this formula. The only one we don't have is the amount invested. And as I said before, there's a slight adaptation we have to do here if you're trading on an account that uses lots instead of actual investment amounts. And so it's that adaptation or that conversion of lots to the amount invested that I'll be covering in the next episode. And as soon as we've done that, we're then in a position to be able to start coding this up in MQL5 to automatically calculate the value at risk for us. As always, thank you again for your time today. If you want to find out more about DarwinX and the services that we offer to traders just like you, you can click on the link right at the bottom of the screen here now. But now until next time, trade safe.